everyone and good afternoon uh, and welcome to the 12th edition or 12th episode of our uh, University of Philippines and Philippine uh, Health Insurance Corporation webinar series on stop COVID deaths. So the, we talk about the clinical management updates on how to fight COVID-19. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento of the National Telehealth Center of the National Institutes of Health, University of the Philippines, Manila. And with me, as always, is my partner, and the special envoy for uh, Global Health Initiatives by the Office of the President, Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado. Dr. Susie. Hello, Raymond, and good day, everyone. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to the webinar. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we hope um, you'll join us in the next Fridays. This is a Friday uh, event that we, we hold uh, in order to find ways to share information, disseminate the latest uh, knowledge that we have coming from our local experts. And it's always been a pleasure having uh, everyone on, on our program. And we hope you'll stay with us, not just today, but in the weeks to come. Raymond. Thank you, Dr. Susie. Uh, you po natatanong, no? this, is, uh, this webinar is actually one of the highest uh, registered po na webinars that we have had. We have more than 700 registrants wow this webinar. So that goes to show uh, the importance of the topic and uh, also and uh, most especially for the uh, the person who will be giving the topic for, uh, who is uh, uh, very highly regarded in the field of anesthesiology. Uh, before we start, uh, we, this uh, webinar series will not be possible without the concerted effort and the hard work and the teamwork of our team over at the University of the Philippines. Uh, led by the Office of the President and Office of the e Executive Vice President, led by uh, Executive Vice President Dr. Teodoro Herbosa, and also the Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs, Dr. Elena Pernia, uh, also represented therein by uh, AVP Rika Abad and also Director Timmy Cabana of EMPRO. Uh, this webinar series will also not be possible without the uh, hard work of our colleagues over at TVUP where mapapanood po natin itong webinar po ito sa ating uh, YouTube channel uh, by, via the TVUP uh, channel po. And uh, TVUP is led by Executive Director Dr. Gigi Alfonso. We also uh, are very thankful for the help in terms of the IT support uh, led by the UP System ITDC led by Director Paolo Pahe. Over the University of Philippines, Manila, uh, we thank the Office of the Chancellor, Chancellor Carmen Cita Padilla, and uh, the Executive Director of the National Institutes of Health, uh, Dr. Eva Maria Cochonco de la Paz, and PGH Director Gap de Gaspi, and the College of Medicine's Dean, uh, Dr. Charlotte Chong, and also our partner, po, uh, the Philippine Health Insurance Corporations, uh, led by uh, President and CEO. Brigadier General Ricardo Morales, and uh, for for this webinar, we are very privileged both for that the opening remarks to be given by a uh, representative from PhilHealth, uh, who will be introduced by Dr. Susie Mercado. Dr. Susie, yeah, uh, Raymond, we're we're uh, getting now. It's coming in where people are watching from. We have people watching from the Bupan, from uh, Nueva Ecija, uh, and. Ito na, Tamol, Tamolatan Medical Hospital, all right? Then we have MMSU. Um, and yeah, put in the chat box where you're coming from. Typically, we have people from all over the country and from other parts of the world. And on the playback, we even have even more people who are watching on uh, the TVUP uh, recording that goes on YouTube. So. For those who will not be able to participate today, but they're interested in this fascinating topic on how the anesthesiologists are coping with COVID-19, encourage them to go on uh, TVUP YouTube and you're going to find all the 12. Raymond, I was having a moment the other day because I just realized we've been doing this for 12 weeks. And when I looked at our first version, it was really horrible, <laughs> but the content, <laughs> the content was fabulous. I mean, we had great, we had uh, great speakers in the very from the very start, and later on when TVUP and the whole, uh, the whole machinery of the University of the Philippines in communications came in, 
we became a little bit more polished and professional looking. But I just want to say that you can view all the previous 12 uh, webinars on uh, UP, uh, TV UP. Just go to YouTube and then click in there, Stop COVID Death webinars. And actually, I watched some of them again and I said they're still very, very relevant to what we're facing right now. So anyway, Raymond, uh, you want to tell them a bit about the certificates before they start asking? So, so thank you, Dr. Susie. So for those who have been emailing and also sending your email, uh, messages via the chat box, uh, certificates, as always, will be provided and sent to you via your email. We have secured the necessary uh, signatures po. And we, so along with the certificates, we will also be sharing a link to the webinar presentation, to the webinar that you attended, provided that you attended the webinar at this 50% po nung duration ng webinar na yon. So we are compiling them and for this week, I think the first batches of uh, there will be a thousand uh, email messages that we will be sending out po to cover all of the previous webinars. And to Dr. Susie's point earlier, I think uh, for each webinar, we have been learning from the previous webinar on how to improve ourselves and also the production team, uh, what are the areas that we need to focus on uh, and uh, how, do, how we'd be able to deliver uh, better content and uh, well better production in, in the future webinars to come. Over to Dr. Susie. Okay, so I'm just checking again now. No, This really fascinates me. Uh, we have Taguig City, St. Luke's Medical Center, uh, Manila Central University, uh, Borja General Hospital in Cagayan de Oro, somebody who's watching from Nepal, Sambuanga City, San Juan Batangas, Quezon Medicare Hospital, uh, Maasin Maternity and Child Hospital in Southern Leyte. Goodness, right? And Olongo Peppa. City. So uh, some of you may be wondering how we're able to get all these people to to, uh, to get on board in terms of the, the webinar. It's because PhilHealth invites everyone. And uh, the reach of PhilHealth is immense. And so I would just like to, to introduce our introductory uh, speaker for today, who those of you who are working in the health sector know him because he's one of those very happy, uh, what should I say, <laughs> very outgoing, very easy to work with uh, individuals. And He's currently Senior Vice President of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation for Health Policy and the Finance Sector. Uh, his full name is Israel Francis Pargas, but we call him Ish. So Ish, welcome to the webinar and thank you to everything PhilHealth has been doing to make this series available to everyone in every corner of the country. Welcome, Ish. Hello, good afternoon. Oh yeah, good afternoon, ma'am, Dr. Susi. And of course, Raymond, and to everyone who's actually online right now, uh, don't worry, Raymond and uh, BM Susie, you both look fabulous on screen <laughs> <laughs> after the 12 sessions. And <laughs> we improve. We try to improve on our looks. Um, yeah. uh, for, so uh, again, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm very thankful that, uh, well, uh, PhilHealth being one of the uh, sponsor organizer, for the, this uh, webinar series, we are also thankful to all those who are actively participating. And uh, just uh, before I give my uh, my uh, remarks, really is uh, we feel health would like to extend, uh, and we really like to extend our deepest gratitude to the UP community for helping us and of course partnering with us and having us in this webinar together of course with the National Telehealth Center. So ayan Raymond ah. uh, And of course, uh, as being represented ably by our board member, the public health, world renowned public health expert, Dr. Oh Susie Mercado. Uh, uh, um, well, still our topic is on COVID and uh, we have seen this pandemic as a catalyst, the COVID being a catalyst to improve on our policy making, on our uh, professional practice, and even on our own personal health safety practices. And uh, this COVID experience is actually, I think as of now, a proof of concept, really, no? Um, on how we can actually uh, expand 
improve, enhance our health system, responding to the needs, and of course, aligning with the concept of uh, what we are planning to do in the nearest future, the universal health care. So nakita na po natin on how the health need or the health system really needs to be improved at yung pong ilang prinsipyo technically din sa UHC, lalo na yung pag-establish ngayon ng mga centers, referral centers, is actually a proof of concept. No? And this is also a proof of concept now that uh, the medical education and even the medical practice is really, it's a showing that it is a continuing process. Uh, we, uh, although most of you attendees here are actually experts in your own fields, um, cases like this, pandemic caused by emerging, emerging diseases or organism, orga, or, organisms would actually need still guidance and um, updated information, be it on a clinical or professional level or even coming from professional experience or personal experience for others. And so we are very grateful that uh, we actually have this platform where we like policymakers and you, most of you experts from the clinics or from the public health, from the academe, probably some of us have been patients or are patients and others are actually movers in the society where we can actually converge learn and discuss uh, through this uh, platform, particularly on the topic COVID. So again, thank you everyone. Thank you uh, the UP community. Thank you to all the organizers. And hopefully we can, uh, we can have a very productive and fruitful discussion, just like what we had in the previous 12 uh, sessions and more to come, uh, more sessions to come, I think later. So good afternoon and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ish, uh, for that message. We hope you'll stay with us uh, if you can. Yes, ma'am. Uh, for the rest, for the rest of the webinar, because it's always good to have a little bit more, a uh, little bit more discussion. And uh, we just want to thank uh, PhilHealth for all its support for the webinar series. Raymond. Thank you so much again, uh, SVP Ish. Marami salamat po for all of the help and support and the patients also for coordinating with all of the hospitals for disseminating uh, the information to your hospital network. Mabuhay po ang field health. Thank you so much, uh, SVP-ish. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you po, sir. Uh, before we proceed with our uh, webinar proper, it's uh, like always, we have this uh, set of fun questions or a fun quiz which represents our uh, pre-webinar questions po for webinar number 12. These questions are often or always provided by our resource speaker and today we have two webinar questions these are uh, question number one states a 76 year old male weighing 70 kilograms at the kidney with labored breathing was referred to the department of anesthesiology for emergent intubation for pneumonia as the patient was being wheeled in at the intensive care unit uh, his vital signs read 95 over 55 uh, for his blood pressure respiratory rate of 28, uh, heart rate of 106, and oxygenation of uh, 73%. As you approach him, the options given here are, option A, immediately give a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant and intubate his trachea after one minute, okay? Uh, option two, uh, option B, start bag mask ventilation and give the muscle relaxant to ease his agitation. Option C, Pre-oxygenate with a tight seal mask and filters in place and administer ketamine amidazolam. And option D, immediately intubate the patient. So uh, we're, we're seeing that the uh, responses po are trickling in and a little over half of our audience is uh, choosing uh, option C. Although uh, but we will not be divulging the correct answers po at this moment because those answers, the correct ones, will be provided by our resource speaker towards the end of our webinar. So on to webinar number, uh, sorry, uh, question number two. After securing his airway, you attach him to a mechanical ventilator. Initial settings are volume control, uh, showing RR of 14, tidal volume of 360 uh, milliliters, tip of a 10, 
FIOT at 100% with the ABG uh, arterial blood gas showing a pH of 7.2. So the options that are shown here, what do you do? Options shown here are increase the, rep, the, the RR to 18 and target a PO2 between 60 to 80. Or option B, increase the RR to 20 and target PO2 between 130 to 200. Option C reads, increase the RR and keep the plateau pressure to less than 40. And option B, increase the RR and ensure driving pressure to more than 20. So, medyo kalat -kalat po. it's evenly, uh, more or less evenly distributed, although there are two uh, options po that our attendees are mostly gravitating to. So, we'll, uh, so uh, for, to, for our 404 attendees uh -huh. for this Zoom webinar, uh, please uh, chime in and provide your responses uh, and we hope to be able to get the correct uh, answers for towards the end of the webinar and to be to give the introduction po of our resource speaker I will turn the floor over to Dr. Susie. Thank you Raymond. So I'm just looking at the chat box again right we've got uh, people watching us from Bacolod from Binyan Doctors from Cagayan de Oro among Rodriguez and Marikina and still coming in and um, this is the biggest number of online uh, sort of current participants we've ever seen uh, just to just to probably underscore how important uh, this topic is and how uh, well supported our speaker is because it looks like the whole anesthesia world is, is watching okay which is a great thing because Really, the purpose of these webinars for the University of the Philippines has been to share local expertise with our community. We don't really need to rely on uh, what other countries are doing. We've got great experts here, and we do have an expert with us today who's going, who's spending some time with us. And it was very interesting, you know, because when we were uh, coming up with the list of speakers, uh, you do recall that one of our first mortalities was an anesthesiologist. And we do know that intubation and other aerosol generating um, procedures like giving oxygen or suction are high risk. And our anesthesiologists cannot keep a, you know, a meter distance from patients. They have to really work close to the patients so the specific situation and the risks that they have to take is really so great compared to others. And so I would say that um, the measures that they've been taking to protect themselves and the innovations are really worth sharing because this just shows their determination, their courage, and their heroic effort. So anyway, uh, well, very well-known anesthesiologist. Uh, she's going to be speaking with us and when I first communicated with us she said with her she said I have to move my schedule around on that day let mm -hmm. me work on it okay so she's really busy and so I think it's great that there's so many people here on on the webinar so it's worth her time that she took off from work uh, to be with us to share with all of these hospitals around the country so I'm referring to um, a well-known anesthesiologist Dr. Grace Ann Banson Herbosa, who is the chair of the Department of Anesthesiology of the Philippine General Hospital and professor at the UP College of Medicine. Grace, welcome to the webinar. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this session. And, and thank you for the invite. I'm privileged to be here this afternoon. Great. Looking great, as always, despite the toxic, uh, <laughs> toxic schedule. Uh, I was going to ask you, Grace, before we start, does your family worry about you every time you go on duty? Well, it's, uh, it was different in the beginning. In the beginning, I remember um, going in the car from the hospital and my youngest daughter would always spray alcohol on me. So that's, <laughs> that's how it was before. Well, it's different now. They've learned so many things. And so they're more relaxed because they know that we're all safe and they, and I being an obsessive compulsive, you know, they know I'm safer to be with than, rather than their dad who's all around the country and a little oh, let's, more relaxed. Let's, let's, probe, to... let's probe this thing about the dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
uh, you know, uh, I'm not gonna say that that she is the wife of, but her husband is EVP Ted Herbosa. And, uh, you know, this couple has been doing great things for, for our country. So we're really just very privileged that we were able to get Grace on this webinar. We had Ted on the first webinar, and I think he's watching like a true sip sip. He's, <laughs> he's watching <laughs> right now. Okay, so Raymond, did you have any questions for Grace before she starts? No, 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 really. No. We, just, uh, we are just really honored and privileged po, that uh, we could have you, uh, Dr. Grace. And just to recognize po, the presence of our Executive Vice President, Dr. Ted Herbosa, who is uh, fully supporting the spouse. So it, uh, it's, really, it's really endearing po, to, you, to see that uh, there is a, that's this sort of uh, uh, support that's given uh, by, by each to one another. Po. So thank you, and for and with that, Paul, we we just like to kick off our um, webinar proper with the sort of uh, questions uh, with regards uh, to the preparatory um, mechanisms that you will need to uh, employ, Paul, in terms of the protocol uh, with taking care of the patient and everything that's uh, that uh, would have to be in place especially in a hospital-based uh, setting po, uh, Dr. Agri. So those are mostly the questions that you probably will be um, answering towards the end of your presentation. Just to, ano po, just to preempt the, the questions. That preempt you... the questions. Actually, we already have questions coming in, but we're not going to uh, keep you away from, from Grace. So Grace, you can put up your slides and start your presentation. I think many people are really just waiting uh, waiting for this for this talk. Go ahead, please. All right. So, do you see the slides? Not yet. We can see you. Not yet, ma'am. Okay. Let me see again. Um, let me do it again. Okay, I think. Uh, okay. So we just need to go to slide show. Okay. So everything's okay? Yes. Yes. All right. Okay, so welcome to this session. Um, I, it's entitled Anesthetic Challenges, and underneath you'd see rapid response, creativity, collaboration in a pandemic. Because that's what exactly what we went through from. March till the present, and I'll be speaking to you about mostly our experience at the Philippine General Hospital as we segued from a regular hospital to a COVID referral center. So anesthesia is known to most uh, people as this, no? With a with a with turning on a light switch, the patient goes to sleep and is offered the gift of, I call it oblivion and the mystery of unconsciousness. However, for the past four months, anesthesia has segued to something else. We've become, aside from the experts of the airway, we have segued from our services from the operating room to outside the operating room, and most especially to the intensive care unit. So, in a pandemic, it's all about conversations, interdepartmental, intradepartmental conversations. And most of the time, what happens? We talk about infection prevention, emergency protocols, hand hygiene, surface decontamination, our own precautions, as well as protecting our family members, and most especially is leadership. Because in a pandemic, it's all about leadership, and how the team works. So this is what happened all these months. Initially, when we were we started as a COVID center, we had a command center, not in the institution. We also had our own command center in the department. Our department has, is a big one. We have 60 residents, 20 fellows, so plus the consultants. We're almost 100. So we created our own command center within the department, we divided into operations, logistics, services, as you can see. We've had daily virtual meetings for a debrief, hundreds of simulations in, in the department as well as interdepartmental. 
And I'm incredibly, incredibly proud of how we proceeded, as you can see. After a week, after the declaration of a, in, in March, we came up with our own COVID-19 primer in the department, which was a guide of all the procedures and protocols from sanitation, disinfection, general anesthesia, how we intubate, and also uh, even transport and uh, sedation protocols as well. So this afternoon, I shall be speaking about um, personal protective equipment, how that's important to us. And what we do, what we thought we did best is tracheal intubation. And then I segue to ARDS basics, mechanical ventilation, how we set it up initially. And I'm answering a few frequently asked questions as I did a survey among my colleagues. And as we look forward, I'll talk about teamwork and leadership. So in the first week of, our, uh, of this pandemic, uh, Washington Post uh, visited the Philippine General Hospital and came up with this article and gave a feature on anesthesiology. But interestingly, in a pandemic, what's most important are the public health measures, which includes masks, um, hand sanitation, social distancing, etc. Okay, personal protective equipment. Now, it was recently said that anesthesia, in anesthesia, this is our first modern pilot goes down with the plane safety issue. So interesting, this metaphor. But it reveals both the shared hazard of a contagion as the foundation for the anxiety that many felt, especially in the beginning. So we, I felt that I should talk about personal protective equipment. And in the PGH, it's very organized now. now we have um, infographics, which had underwent so many different versions. The area zones were mapped as the green zone, the orange and the red zone. And these were matched together with what exactly personal protective equipment should be used at that area. So we had levels one, two, three, and four, as you can see. And I think in all institutions, you should have this because this um, lessens the anxiety of the healthcare worker as well. Now, PPEs is actually a, an emotive issue. That's what I call it. Why? Because access to PPEs is not just about protecting the safety of healthcare workers and, and sustaining the workforce for the needs of the nation. But the most important reason that PPEs should be a priority is that hospital workers themselves can be an important vector for spreading the virus. In fact, um, in China, Italy, uh, the UK and US, health workers were a major source of uh, infection. It, they made up between 20 to even 60% of confirmed cases, as in Australia. So what evidence do we have regarding PPEs? Publications are divided into three groups. One is the non-clinical laboratory and simulation studies. Two is the SARS experience many years back. And three are systematic reviews incorporating both one and two. So the use of N95 masks in the literature is not all cohesive. There are, uh, there are articles by Radonovich and Long as well as Cook. Although N95s are prioritized for high risk aerosol generating evidence, generating procedures, there's, there's very little evidence that shows that it offers better protection than just the surgical mask. However, when infection of a potentially fatal disease is occurring among healthcare workers, especially the frontliners, more cautious, the more cautious posture is warranted along with the greater acknowledgement of the uncertainty inherent in these recommendations. So our very best protection is really the N95. And the N95 should be properly fitted. I'm not sure if all anesthesiologists know that there is a device wherein you test your N95s. And this device is actually um, available here from 3M. 
what happens is you enter, you wear your respirator, your mask, and then use a hood and a bitter tasting uh, liquid is sprayed in. You move your head back and forth, bend your body, and you, we try to see if there is um, tasting of this uh, liquid. Okay, the supply of PPEs, as we all know, is limited, okay? And yet our capacity to consume is not. In fact, in Canada, during the SARS experience, 18,000 N95s were used each day then. So this is the context wherein we try to see how to create guidelines on the usage of PPEs. This should be institutionalized and is different among different institutions. There is really no universal single rule because the resources should always be taken into account. What modeled the issue uh, recently is the debate on whether COVID is airborne or not. And in fact, the WHO, I think, has recently acknowledged that it is also airborne. Now, this is unfortunate because now it becomes even more dangerous than before. There's an emphasis on rationalizing guidelines. Now we consider it contact droplet as well as airborne. And as you can see for COVID, the risk is pretty much dynamic. And this will affect the cost benefit balance of our PPEs. Now this is an interesting um, equation that was published by Wilson recently. It's, um, it emphasizes time of exposure, which is very important. The infection risk is directly proportional to B, which is the breathing zone variant aerosol concentration, the minute ventilation of the health worker, and the time exposed over mask efficiency. Now, taking all of that into consideration, in PGH, we have this um, infographic on who is a close contact. And as you can see, we have here a space of two meters or about six feet of a COVID individual. You need more than 15 minutes of an encounter to be considered a close contact, proper PPEs, and whether you've had unprotected direct contact with infectious secretions, which is combated by hand hygiene. So aside from that, there have been studies through which, which says that the COVID viral particles can travel large distances, even up to four minutes, and they remain more than three hours in air. So that's really uh, mind boggling. Now this is a study in SARS many years back, and it uh, shows you the odds of the different airway, airway procedures. Tracheal intubation has the highest odds for an infection, it's 6.6. .6. Tracheostomy is second at 4.2, non-invasive ventilation is 3.2, and manual ventilation is 2.8. So this just guides us as to our odds now when intubating a COVID patient. So let's talk about specifics this time. So as you all know, as I said, the evidence for N95 plus uh, respirator masks is really low. Physical science says they are more protected, they are these are more protective than surgical masks and there's very li limited clinical evidence uh, saying this as well. Lockhart, on the other hand, has a lot of interesting um, findings and he adds the use of double gloves and neck protection to increase or lessen the risk of the healthcare worker. And these are the pictures from Lockhart, which shows that there is breach in the interface between the glove and the surgical gown, as well as the neck. So PPE is not enough on its own. However, it must be part of a larger institutional guideline. In fact, what's even more important is donning and doffing, simulation, training, as well as wearing a fit tested respirator. And time management is critical as well. We have, we'd never have to rush donning and doffing because we have to take care of our own personal protection. Now this, a lot of institutions are now uh, starting to use purified 
uh, respirate, uh, powered respirators, which is the popper. However, the studies have shown that the more complex the PPE, we should just like the, using the popper, the greater the risk of self-contamination. So if you do decide to use a popper, just make sure that you have simulated it many times because the hood here has a skeleton that you wear in your head and just removing it will create so much movement and you can self-contaminate yourself. Aside from this, complex PPEs may in impede intubations as well as CPR, okay? So if you have a small marginal safety gain, gain using this PPE, this may have a disproportionately greater impact on self-contamination as well. Other uh, creative solutions were the introduction of the intubation boxes, and I'm sure most of you have used them. However, there, this, the use of intubation boxes, if you're not used to it, again, may reduce your first pass intubation success if you haven't simulated it and you're using it for the first time. That's because we're not used to intubation boxes, right? So Lockhart actually discourages what we call MacGyvering or homemade PPE combinations, which can include uh, intubating boxes and other inventions if you're not used to it. And although this was initially uh, crafted to reduce the anxiety of the intubator, if you're not used to it, it may even increase your anxieties. So what do we know? Hospitals are frequent sources of outbreaks. The quality of PP evidence is actually low. Now we are thinking of a droplet versus an airborne spread. It's time exposed. So the faster you intubate, the better. PP supply is globally limited. And what's very important for us as well as for our trainees is training, simulation, and fit testing. Using complicated PPEs can be associated with breaches. And so it's discouraged. And the superiority of N95 or the FFP2 respirator mask is recognized, although the evidence is poor. So this is the journal article by Lockhart. And again, uh, he proposes three PPE types for droplet and contact PPEs. We use a mask, gown, gloves. If, it's, if it becomes airborne, you add an N95 respirator mask. And if it's a aerosol generating procedure, you add your neck protection, gown, as well as double gloves. However, in a pandemic, remember that the absence of evidence, however, should not imply evidence of absent airborne spread. Okay, so this is just, uh, again, re repeating that we need neck protection, take care of the gown glove interface, especially in your gloving. It discourages MacGyver homemade com combinations of PPEs. Essential staff should be present at the area. All the rest should not be there. And they advocate uh, having shower resources for the intubator right after. So the final word really is there's no ideal PPE, but rather focus on protection, which is consistent after practice as well as simulation. So this just shows you an example of a MacGyver homemade PPE. This is a homemade um, a machine. And what's probably most important is really to come together as a department and do discussions as well as interdepartment discussions with the infectious diseases and the pulmonary people, be able to gain approval and guidance on its use, its appropriateness, safety, decontamination, disinfection. And we always have to remember that if we do all these MacGyver things, we become more visually and hearing impaired because of the motor and you can't hear everybody else. So what's the important takeaway? Again, the significance of airborne transmission changes all our our management. The use of PPE should be part of a larger safety system at the institution. And probably what's more important than a negative pressure room is really ventilation, the frequency of air exchanges.
because negative pressure really what it does is just prevents the movement of air within the room to the outside. In fact, the Chinese evidence suggests that COVID transmission at intubation is really low if you don the appropriate PPEs. And um, again, they emphasize post-exposure disinfection, which includes showering. What else do we have to remember? That the use of high-flow nasal O2 and supraglottic airway placement even can be aerosol generating. Masks will give us, the ordinary surgical masks will give us a protection of at least 80%. Cook highlights two main PPE problems, the supply, as well as its inappropriate use, meaning using higher level than required. PPE should be simple to remove or doff after use to reduce contamination risks. And Cook highlights the increased risk of self-contamination with more complex PPEs. So again, this is just a table that shows you if you have contact precautions to airborne precautions, your PPEs move from just a plain gloves and glove down to an N95 respirator mask when you have airborne precautions. And at the same time, um, we have to identify in our hospitals the hot spots where aerosol generating procedures are regularly performed and these are in the intensive care units, operating theaters and emergency department, resuscitation base, as well as the labor wards with mothers in stage two to three labor. So lastly, again, we emphasize uh, the lack of PPEs to do wise PPE choices considering the spectrum of risk, hazard and cost. And again, we highlight that negative pressure really confers hardly any protection on those in the room because its main purpose is really to prevent escape of the contagion to areas outside the room. So in the market today, and even in our operating rooms, we see a lot of these respirator masks. So what is the statement given by the American Patient Safety Foundation as well as the ASA? It supports anesthesia professionals who, may purchase, who wants to purchase and wear al alternate approved respirators, and this are it. And this is their statement, that they recommend that you work with your anesthesia department, infection prevention personnel, and other stakeholders on a common policy. Such considerations may take into consideration availability of N95s, failure of N95 fit testing, and other contingencies that may affect healthcare worker safety and patient care. So the decision to use it, it really belongs to your institution because there has been um, contention about or questions about the exhaled air, which is not filtered when we use these respirators. Next, we go to tracheal intubation, something we think or we thought we knew so well. So what are the challenges in this pandemic? One is laryngoscope type. Previously, we train all our residents with direct laryngoscopy and probably that's a standard, but currently the video laryngoscope is preferred. Induction technique has segued from regular induction to a rapid sequence induction and intubation. For aerosol generating procedures, before we can do mask ventilation for induction, but now we avoid it and use rather a tight seal, sealed mask. Now filters, are necessary before it was optional. And we use HME and HEPA filters with a 99.9% .9 efficiency. Suctions have changed from the open suction device. Now we use a closed suction. And for intubation as well as extubation, we minimize aerosols or airborne droplets through the use now of maybe plastic drapes, intubation boxes, even wet sponges in the face of the patient. And extubation is just as important as intubation. So now we give our patients routinely antiemetics and we now we extubate under the drapes. And among the lessons learned in these four months is that the infection of the healthcare worker is, is markedly reduced if, if we intubate with, at the first pass. If more than one attempt at intubation was required or when more than three people were in the room, this increases the risk of infection to the healthcare worker markedly. So when previously any anesthesiologist of any year level will do the intubation, now 
only the most senior and experienced anesthesiologists will do in the intubations. At the Philippine General Hospital, you will not see a first year intubating a COVID patient. So this is a schematic on, on intubation. Now, first of all, all people, everybody in the room should be at least uh, six feet away from the patient if possible. And we try to avoid as much as possible emergent intubation. We prefer an elective intubation, meaning when called um, and the patient meets a certain threshold as defined by your department, we are called so we can don and doff at a regular pace. And then um, intubation, if persistent oxygen requirement is greater than six liters to maintain a S or arterial O2 greater than 92%, then we're called for an intubation, okay? An assistant is always present or a body with the intubator who stays relatively far away or six feet away from the patient with the rapid sequence induction, a bag mask ventilation with a filter applied, use a video laryngoscope. And, we, and for really critically ill patients, we bundle this procedure of intubation with an insertion of an A-line or a CVP if needed. Uh, most of our patients now require a HD or a hemodialysis cath insertion in anticipation of the cytokine storm. So all our intub in the beginning of the pandemic, we held daily virtual meetings in the morning where we present the census for the day just for airway, okay? And then we debrief the residents how many failed, how many were failed first attempts. We debrief them and try to see and improve our uh, procedures. We have cohorted patients into the COVID wards and non-COVID wards. This is just a picture on PPEs, how it's worn with a safety officer, how it's checked and labeled properly. And the hundreds of simulations that we've done with our residents, okay. And this is a team, an airway team, just ready to intubate outside. They have a small huddle, carry the video laryngoscope with them as well as an intubation box. So intubations outside the operating room are definitely more difficult than the operating room intubations. The risk of failed intubations is several fold greater in the ICUs. In the operating room, our primary objective is really to secure the airway after induction of anesthesia in a controlled environment. In the ICU, we do it as a life-saving intervention in a patient with an impending respiratory failure. It's associated with significant complications as severe hypotension, hypoxemia, and even cardiac arrests up to 25%. And in a difficult airway situation, the intensivist has, doesn't have the option to awaken the patient as in the difficult airway protocol that we have in anesthesia at the operating room. And to facilitate this, we are masters of the use of muscle relaxants. And we use this because it gives us better conditions for laryngoscopy, it reduces airway trauma. We can secure the airway in fewer attempts. And we have available rocuronium and succinylcholine to facilitate intubation. And our recommended uh, muscle relaxant is high doses of rocuronium because we can intubate at a shorter period of time and it has a reversal agent that can help us in a can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario. So the identific identification of a difficult airway is paramount and its incidence can be more than 11% and serious adverse events are high up to 40% of cases. In fact, the fatality rate is up to 88% for those requiring mechanical ventilation. Now we have simple scoring systems different from what we've learned in anesthesia. For the COVID era, we use the Makocha scale, which is a score of six items, which involves six uh, patient factors, malempathic classification greater than two, obstructive sleep apnea, cervical spine limitation, limited mouth opening coma, as well as severe hypox hypoxemia and the operator factor, which is a non-anesthesiologist. 
which gives you a perfect score of 12 for difficulty of intubation. This is an example that was a true example that we had at the Philippine General Hospital, a 79 year old, 160 kilograms or morbidly obese with a saturation as low as 54% in the patient with a norepinephrine drip. If you look at the scoring system, he had a score of 10, which we knew was a difficult intubation. And true enough, the, the intubator did five attempts, failed. And since we knew it was a, an anticipated difficult airway, the ENT people are, were there to do a surgical airway at the ICU. So there are many studies all over the world that shows you how unprepared the ICU is for a difficult airway. In France, 43% of intubators were not fully proficient. 18.8% really had no intubation training just through lectures and observation. Video laryngoscope's use was just reserved for difficult airways. And although 83% of this intensivist placed less than 10 LMAs, half had less than 10 intubation experiences. In Spain, three-fourths of its ICUs do not have intubation or difficult airway protocols. There's no identification of experts who, who does difficult airways. There are no guidelines on the management of the ICU patient with difficult airway. Same in Japan. They, some didn't have difficult airway carts. Capnography wasn't present. At the UK, again, 6.3% of ICU patients had an increased risk of airway complications. Only 19% had plans for difficult airways. And in Australia as well, there are very little protocols in place. This is our experience at the Philippine General Hospital from the beginning, from the middle of March to June. We had 148 calls for intubations and among 148, 14% or 21 were re-intubations. So this is bothersome because it increases the exposure to COVID infection among our trainees and it uses more PPEs again. And if you look at the profiles in PGH, 57% of these intubations were done on patients with pneumonia and acute respiratory failure, 22% other conditions and 21% with CNS pathology. The medications were a combination of um, ketamine and rocuronium for 34%, propofol and rocuronium 16%, and we have other combinations of a sedative, an analgesic, as well as a muscle relaxant in the rest, or 50%. Now, mortality for intubations is dismal, okay? At PGH and worldwide, there's a 70 to 80% mortality once the patient is intubated. In fact, uh, mortality in 24 hours, there was a 48% mortality within 30 minutes after intubation. And ultimately, these patients will arrest with 52% within 24 hours of intubation. So that's really sad. So we tried to debrief and talk to the intensivists as well as the pulmonologists. We came up with all this with our primer, as I said. Wherein we have infographics on how we do all our procedures, how we do our RSI, what's in our intubation boxes, our simulation sessions, our sedation protocol. And as you can see, for the repeated or the re-intubations, -re we came up with using DERM4, which is um, the evidence shows that it's probably the best uh, plaster that we can use. And we started using this Anchor fast, which secures the airway. So now we hardly have had calls for reintubation. We use a stat CO2 device to verify the placement of our endotracheal tubes. And most uh, recently, we reviewed our outcomes. And as I said, since seventy percent of our patients will die within twenty-four hours, and uh, Forty percent of our patients will arrest within 30 minutes of intubation. We started using or adding a prophylactic vasopressor to our induction agents, which is phenylephrine 50 to 100 micrograms or epinephrine 10 micrograms. We call it pre-intubation optimization, and it's, a, it's actually a push dose presser, which is based on clinical judgment. If the patient is in shock with a systolic blood pressure less than 90, 
and you have a hemodynamically unstable patient with very low um, saturations, then probably this will help our patients. We use phenylephrine, 150 to 100 micrograms, and epinephrine, 10 micrograms. Okay, this is supposed to improve your hemodynamics as you intubate, because as you remember, if you have a dysnic or tachypnic patient with very low saturation, let's say 70%, 50%, uh, the patient's breathing and with all that negative pressure inside his uh, thoracic cavity, with, the, with giving your sedative agents and the muscle relaxants and changing to a positive pressure ventilation, this will impede your venous return, and that's the reason why your patient will arrest ultimately. So this might help. We don't have the outcomes yet. So we have revised our protocols, our intubation protocols several times. We've gone through several simulation exercises. Only a senior operator does the intubations. We have an airway consultant for the week. A stat, we use a stat seal to device. We identify the difficult airway just by the phone call itself. We use a Makocha score. And now we've started using a prophylactic vasopressor as part of our induction kit. We do weekly audits now versus the daily huddles before. And our long-term goal in the department is really to up our difficult airway workshop and being proficient in fiber optic intubations and teach our residents a scalpel finger tube surgical airway technique. So what are the key anesthetic principles for airway management in the ICU patient? One again is emphasis on oxygenation. It's not intubation, which now is the priority at all times. When we choose airway equipment, it should be purchased with the least experienced user in mind. It should be intuitive, user-friendly, requiring a short training period. You cannot buy the most um, exotic video laryngoscope and use it for the first time on a COVID patient. That will definitely fail. Now the devices you choose should have sufficient evidence and the rescue devices in case of a difficult airway should be should have a close to 100% success rate. So you have to take into consideration in this pandemic urgency and the operator's anxiety of impending patient morbidity and mortality because this can hinder the success of any device. The devices should have been trialed over an adequate period of time, but and we should also give emphasis to extubations. Extubations should be planned in a similar manner to intubations. At the Philippine General Hospital, the airway team is also called during extubations that's made by the intensivists. And again, we emphasize non-technical training because as we don our PPEs and we're visually and hearing impaired, communication is key. So you should have your hand signs or work together in a simulation session. So with just a signal, you know exactly what is needed. So this is just a picture of our airway team ready to go with their video laryngoscope, the screen, as well as their intubation box. And after intubation, let's segue now to the critical care management of our patients. But let me just give you a story. This is a story of the polio epidemic in Copenhagen, 1952. In Copenhagen then, there was 5,700 cases of polio. Two and half of this experienced respiratory failure or bulbar paralysis. But then they only had one iron lung and six cuirass respirators. This is a respirator outside the body wherein it exerts negative pressure to help the patient breathe. And at that time, there was a 95% mortality. Now, this is the story of Vivi. These are the notes on the right side. In 1952, Vivi is 12 years old with fever and paralysis then in Copenhagen. There was an attempt for tracheostomy using local anesthesia, but they experienced a lot of mucus, spasm, and then everybody leaves the room because they knew it was infectious, except for a certain Dr. Ibsen. Dr. Ibsen was the first anesthesiologist in Copenhagen, 1952, who had American training. And Dr. Ibsen injected 100 milligrams thiopental, which enabled the tracheostomy and ventilation to proceed. And, and luckily, Vivi survived. Now, Dr. Ibsen, as I said, is the anesthesiologist, and he 
had the idea of caring for all such patients at a, with a one-to-one -one ratio in a dedicated ward. So they started hand ventilation in 1952. They, had, they ventilated 300 polio cases per week in Copenhagen then. And the mortality, which was initially more than 90%, with this ventilation technique, as you see in this picture, they engaged 1,500 students. They did 165,000 ventilation hours in 286 days. And mortality redu was reduced markedly to 25%. Fascinating, diba? And this one is a picture in the one of the doors in Spain during the recent COVID pandemic in their ICU. As you can see, a total, they're saying thank you to their medicals of 9,285 doctors, 2,600 were intensivists, and 6,600 were anesthesiologists or 71%. Because truly anesthesia and in intensive care go together. And I hope that our training in anesthesia will now give importance to critical care medicine as well. So let's go to some key uh, academic moments. I'd like to teach you the concept of a PF ratio. That's a arterial oxygen over FiO2 or the fraction of inspired oxygen. This also known as, known as Horowitz, Carrico, or it's simply the PF ratio. It's widely used as a indicator of hypoxemia. So let me just um, illustrate it with this example, the importance of using a PF ratio. Patient one is in room air, patient two is in the mech vent. If you look at PO2 alone, the patient on mech vent seems to be doing well with 90 versus the one in, in room air at 60. But if you do the ratio, considering FiO2s of 21% for room air, it gives you a mild hypoxemia at 285 versus the one with mech vent with initially with a higher PO2 over 50 is a moderate hypoxemia. This actually defines what ARDS is all about and it's different um, gravity or severity. ARDS through the Berlin criteria means worsening respiratory symptoms within seven days. Chest imaging will show you bilateral opacities. And the edema etiology is respiratory failure, not explained by cardiac failure or fluid overload. Oxygenation defines its severity. Normal PF ratio is three to 500. Mild is two to 300. Moderate is one to two. And severe is less than 100. That's considering all their patients it has a PEEP or a CPAP greater than five. So again, normal PF ratio is three to five and severe is less than 100. Usually our patients get intubated and mechanically ventilated if your PF ratio is 150 or less. And of course, this is accompanied by worsening mortalities as your PF ratios become more severe. This is just a schematic of how we managed it. As you can see, based on your PF ratios, if you are more than 150, you just use light sedation and you use a sedation scale. However, the moment your PF ratio is less than 150, then you start using analgesics, sedation, as well as muscle relaxants, and use a targeted level of sedation and probably put your patient in a prone position and later on ECMO. So the Society on Critical Care Medicine Clinical Practice Guidelines in 2016 suggests a continuous IV infusion for a muscle relaxants if your PF ratio is less than 150. And this is usually given for 48 hours in the early part of ARDS. And the accuracy trial has shown that early administration of your muscle relaxants improves your survival, it reduces barotrauma, and increases the ventilator off days of our critically ill patients. Again, this is a schematic on severe ARDS criteria. Again, if your patient has a better PF ratio, the way to manage your patient on a mechanical ventilator is through a pain agitation delirium um, protocol. You have to take care of the pain first, 
followed by sedation, then the delirium, then the muscle relaxation. And if your patient is severely uh, affected and you need to do prone positioning, that's the only time you have to give your muscle relaxants, especially if your patient's on ECMO. So I'd like to introduce to you this wonderful rapid review, rapid evidence reviews by Acta Medica. It's a free and easily accessible uh, reviews for the COVID-19 crisis. This is led by the dance couple, Indai and Tony, Dr. Cabaluna, Bayona. And this is a group of 70 clinical epidemiologists and health professionals from the Institute of Clinical Epidemiology. They voluntarily did rapid evidence reviews. They, they refer to themselves as wrappers. And uh, these are quick guides on questions we have on the COVID crisis. And for anesthesia, they came up with what is the second sedative agent that you add to dexmed etomidine for sedation of COVID-19? Because clearly dexmed etomidine is a good choice for mechanically ventilated patients. And in case you have ven ventilator asynchrony and have to add a sedative, they recommend that we combine dexmed etomidine with propofol over the benzodiazepine because of the higher incidence of delirium with benzodiazepines. So clearly NMBs are not, okay, the first line agents for managing undesired movement, agitation, or ventilator asynchrony. What we have to do first is give our patients analgesics followed by sedatives or amnesic agents. NMBs for these indications are generally reserved for patients in whom conventional strategies of sedation and analgesia have failed. So I'd just like to share with you the tables for sedation guidance in intubated COVID patients in our primer, which we, we, we can share with you as well. This is the table for sedatives and our muscle relaxants for intubation and maintenance as an infusion rate. So again, just as a reminder what ARGE is all about and its uh, classification according to severity. And then we now segue to mechanical ventilation and the question of anesthesia machines as mechanical ventilators. Now, for low resource areas, there have been questions on, can we really use anesthesia machines as mechanical ventilators? So this is a picture of part of the anesthesia machine. You're familiar with this? We use a rebreathing system. We all know this, and we're able to do, it, to do this because we have a carbon dioxide absorber versus a mechanical ventilator, which is a non-rebreathing system. So the exhaled air is just vented out to the atmosphere, okay? Now in a anesthesia machine, wherein we use a carbon dioxide absorber, we can manage and change our settings if we have a N-tidal CO2 as high as 52. Anesthesia machines really are designed to be fully attended at all times, diba? Nakakabit ang anesthesiology sa machine. They're not intended for long-term use. So in case you decide to use it as a ventilator, it needs to be rebooted, restarted for proper calibration accuracy and performance. It requires a clinician to be at proximity at all time. Don't ever leave your patient if you decide to use it. There's some concern about the alarm system because the volumes are not as loud as the mechanical ventilators. And we always have to be wary about residual anesthetic agents in the breathing systems as well as its, as its medication interaction. Well, anyway, if you do, to reduce CO2 rebreathing in a mechanical ventilator, fresh gas flow should always be set at 50% of or more of the minute ventilation, which is 3.4 here, and fresh flow is at two liters. Okay. So once you've intubated your patient, do we know how to do our initial ventilator settings at the ICU? So again, this is a schematic, and I'll go through it one by one. So don't be anxious about it. But generally, if we set our ventilator, tidal volume should be at 6 ml per kilogram based on ideal body weight. Hindi yung totoong 
body weight. But the ideal body weight, PIP is usually set between 8 to 12, RR 16 to 20. FiO2 is usually titrated uh, according to your saturations. However, in a respiratory failure, we always start with 100%. Take the ABGs. And the key number is a 7.2 pH. If it's less than 7.2, respiratory rate is increased. Okay. Then I'll go through certain goals in the ventilator. Plateau pressure should be less than 30. Driving pressure should be less than 15. So these are the key numbers that we should always remember. So again, key point. Tidal volume should be ML per predicted body weight, okay, which is a surrogate for the patient's lung volume. Actual body weight should never be used as a replacement for the predicted body weight. Again, our goals here, tidal volume is selected, which is here, 330. And we try to maintain a plateau pressure less than 30. So what is a plateau pressure and how do we set it? To get your plateau pressure less than 30, we press inspiratory hold on this side of your screen. And this refers to your plateau pressure. Again, key number, it should be less than 30. If you get a plateau pressure more than 30, you have to reduce your tidal volume down to 4 cc per kilo. Okay? Next is setting your PEEP. Just as a reminder in this volume pressure curve, PEEP is supposed to keep your airway open. And the PEEP sh should be set so there's no atelectasis, neither over distension. And you keep your airways here on this side of the curve. OK. Next is the concept of driving pressure. Driving pressure, the key number is 15. It should be less than 1.5 or 15. And driving pressure is really plateau pressure minus PEEP. So plateau pressure less than 30 minus your PEEP of 10. You keep it less than 15. Patients are usually started at an FiO2 of 100%, especially if hypoxemic, then you check your ABG. And our target is really a saturation between 92 to 96% only. So aside from this, you should make sure that your patient should be well sedated and they breathe together a ventilator. If they become asynchronous, which can be seen by these jagged waveforms here in your ventilator, your patient's fighting your ventilator. And as you can see, if your set tidal volume here is 380, what the actual, the actual tidal volume of your patient with his effort is almost 800 here at 797. So here, this is a picture of ventilator dyssynchrony. Now, ventilator dyssynchrony is associated with the worst outcomes, okay? So a recent trial has shown, although giving muscle relaxants in ARDS has not improved the outcomes, it has not been associated with increased harm. So we may use muscle relaxants to help our asynchronous patients, okay? And if you still have... Um, if you already have a well-sedated patient and, mus and given muscle relaxants, we next do a recruit rec recruitment maneuver to improve your hypoxemic patient. What does recruitment mean? It's just to recruit your alveoli to improve oxygenation. Okay, so it's the application of a sustained pressure to open up the collapsed alveoli. And there are two downsides. If you over distend, that's bad, and if that happens, you just temporarily discontinue it, or it, you can have hemodynamic instability when you have recruitment. So how do you do your recruitment maneuver? It's actually a stepwise PEEP approach. Patient is sedated and relaxed, FiO2 is 100, and you set to pressure control. Pressure control at 15 centimeters water, inspiratory time at three seconds, and you do a rate of 10 breaths per minute. You increase PEEP three centimeters every five breaths and check if your patient is improving. If the patient at any one time desaturates or becomes hypotensive, you stop and return to your prior PEEP. And then after 
achieving the correct PEEP and correct oxygenation, you should to, to do a stepwise decremental PEEP trial. You shift now from pressure to volume control. Again, at four to six ml per kilogram, you reduce now your PEEP by twos every 30 seconds until you get the correct PEEP that is optimized and best for your patient. This is just an example of how you do that. If your PEEP, you start at 20, you reduce two centimeters every 30 seconds. And you check your PEEP platform, uh, P plateau by pressing on the inspiratory hold. And as you can see, at 14, plateau pressure has now less than 30. But if it's between 10 to 12, it's even better at 24 to 26. And your driving pressure is less than 15. So this is probably the best PEEP for your patient, okay? And if your patient worsens, now this is the intensivist's um, role. They start to prone your patient with the aim of improving oxygenation to the posterior lung and improving ventilation perfusion matching. And if the patient again worsens, then the consideration for ECMO comes in. It's a veno-venous ECMO. However, in the EOLIA trial, there has been uh, no evidence of ECMO being better. Although now in the COVID-19 pandemic, some centers are reporting successes with the ECMO. And so we just have to wait and see if it will really benefit our patients. So, so far I've talked about uh, PPEs by keeping, as I said, you just keep it simple and safe. We have to note being visually and hearing impaired as we don our PPEs. Doffing is probably the most important regarding self-contamination. And we always have to consider infection risk versus patient's perioperative risk. And PPEs is really a part of the institution. We went through the different phases, um, how to improve tracheal intubation outside the, in, outside the operating room by revising your protocols, doing simulation. And most importantly, uh, now is I'd like to suggest the inclusion of a prophylactic vasopressor for your patients. And what's more important is really to go into conversations with your intensivists on how to improve such a procedure which we thought we are experts on. I went through the vent different mechanical ventilator concepts of the PF ratios less than 150, keeping your plateau pressures less than 30, driving pressures less than 15, keeping your tidal volumes four to six ml of the predicted body weight. So the, how to get your plateau pressure, I emphasize you just press on the inspiratory hold. If you do get ventilator dyssynchrony, you start a process of giving your patients analgesia, sedation, as well as muscle relaxation. I went through the recruitment maneuver as well. So let's go to the last part of the lecture, which is uh, frequently asked questions. I went through a motion asking my friend in anesthesia what they'd like to find out because of the immense vastness of the topics that we should cover. And one of these is how long should we wait to enter the operating room after a patient has been intubated? And can a staff with N95 masks just go in and out and work right away after intubations? Now this is scientific. If your operating room is um, scientifically or well-made, we expect an operating room to have a 15 air exchange per hour. And if you have 15 air exchanges per hour after intubation, you expect 99% of your airborne pathogens will be removed in 18 minutes, 99.9% .9 removal in 30 minutes or so. So the staff will leave the OR before intubation can safely enter you wearing just plainly a surgical mask in 18 minutes and the staff wearing N95s can just enter in at any time, actually, including intubation and extubation. Now, if you ask me, what about operating rooms with no air exchanges? You know, I don't really know the answer because there's no uh, study that can 
mention that. But if you just have merely two air exchanges per hour, I guess you just have to wait 138 minutes or even 200 minutes before re-entering the room. Next question, should asymptomatic patients be considered COVID-19 positive? Now the answer here really depends on the prevalence of COVID-19 in your community. Now asymptomatic carriers are less likely to be present in areas with low COVID-19 prevalence. Siguro kung yung pasyente nyo nasa, um, what is no, let's say in, in a province with hardly any COVID-19, then asymptomatics just are just considered as regular patients. But this should really be, the decision should really be in coordination with your infectious disease specialists. And again, you review together collectively your available data regarding prevalence. Next question, are there recommendations for EGDs or procedures with high risk of aerosolization? Now the decisions are based again on community spread and prevalence of COVID-19 in your area. You should consider risk assessment, the skill of the endoscopists, as well as the local resources. Now, endotracheal tubes really provide the most secure airway. Even the procedural oxygen mask, it's a mask with a hole for your um, endoscopy, for your endoscopy, should limit dispersion. But again, they're not a safe alternative um, unless you have the appropriate PP. And again, endotracheal tubes are probably the way to go. Now, what is the stance on safety of regional anesthesia and obstetrical patients versus general anesthesia? The Society for Obstetric Anesthesia in the United States says that there's no contraindication to any racial block and spinals and epidurals should consider appropriate precautions. Now, it's best that once you give labor analgesia to your patients, you attach your patient to a to a device that will give continuously your local anesthetic. So it lessens the number of times you visit your COVID laboring patients in the labor room. So there's less resource waste as well as less um, transmission risk. Next is uh, what are the recommendations on using a negative pressure room when intubating a COVID-19 patient? I mentioned this in the lecture initially that a negative pressure room is not necessary. What's more important is the ventilation in the room, as well as keeping the healthcare workers to a minimum when intubating COVID-19 patients. Again, um, it is a decision wherein we collaborate with our, our friends in infection control, in planning the appropriate locations, as well as policy development. For asymptomatic patients in an ECQ area, are there recommendations regarding use of LMAs versus endotracheal tubes? Again, if we're classified as an ECQ, then probably the prevalence of COVID-19 is high. So maybe it's best to use an endotracheal tube. We also have to consider what kind of test result did the patient use? We should consider the sensitivity as well as specificity of testing. Again, the prevalence in the community and for the risk of exposure, we should always consider whether LMA, monitored anesthesia care, and regional cases would have a risk for general anesthesia conversion. Meaning, let's say, if you're doing an ERCP in a patient, maybe it's been, we, and previously we've done it under monitored anesthesia care or local anesthesia or sedation, since the risk is high for a conversion to general anesthesia, might as well start with general anesthesia for these patients, in a, in a, especially in a community with a high prevalence of COVID. Again, uh, what about mental health? This is of utmost importance because of the fear and anxiety for anesthesia providers. We have to deal with this. So we have regular psychosocial processing sessions at the department. We have debrief sessions as well as stress relieving sessions. Again, this is a collaboration with the Department of Psychiatry. Is there such a thing as social distancing at the OR? Well, the, the way to do it is really to minimize talking in the OR. Only people with active duties should remain inside. Never congregate in the work areas. And we, fash we have OR breaks with our, 
among our anesthesiologists. Let's say for a open heart surgery that we do, we relieve each other every four hours. So looking forward and considering leadership at the Philippine Hospital, we thank all the leaders in the hospital from our director to all the committees that have handled our COVID uh, patients. There has been a strategic decision to cohort the COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 populations. So it creates an environment of safety for our physicians, our staff, our patients, and for our visitors. We've created policies subject to revision to address the circumstances of a very fluid and uncertain area. We've conducted a hospital-wide COVID-19 testing or surveillance. And the result of the surveillance showed a 1.4% positive rate among the healthcare workers, among four, more than 4,000 healthcare workers that have been tested. This is a very low prevalence, so showing you how our healthcare workers have been prote protected. They have been tracing efforts, testing, because of the low prevalence at the PGH, testing on a regular basis now becomes um, expensive, so we don't recommend it unless the patient is symptomatic. And uh, we have implemented strict physical distancing. So these are pictures of our um, healthcare workers at the Papagena Hospital. And we've also addressed several, several medical staff concerns on mental health, psychosocial processing, as well as stress debriefing. So as we segued and opened our doors to the non-COVID patients, teleconsults have now been established. Uh, there have been online appointments for pre-operative assessments and post-operative follow-ups. Our pain clinic is very active doing teleconsults among all the pain patients. We have a council that decides on scheduling of elective and urgent operations. This is a picture of our telecomusta, how we virtually meet the patients as well. And the patients are quick to do this as well. So with that, um, among our, for this past hour or so, we've talked about many of the anesthesia challenges in a pandemic from personal protective equipment, tracheal intubations, ARDS basics, mechanical ventilation. The most common questions that you have, and I've, since it's a pandemic, I emphasize the leadership roles, collaboration, creativity and a response, and just being positive all the way. So as anesthesiologists, we ensure and try to expedite recovery as much as possible because this is more critical than ever, especially now. We use short-acting anesthetics and make sure our patients recover fast and well. The anesthetic challenges has been truly um, wanting. We're, we, we're not seen all the time in media, but actually I believe that we're probably the most important and most high-risk population. I believe in building a great team and build a system for keeping track of all our work. So that's documentation so we can go back to it and revise it. We give feedback, uh, it's very important quickly and be direct, we, have, we should have regular meetings. We learn, watch, work really hard. We take risks and ask help when it's needed the most. So maybe one day, this is the way we work. Um, it is um, one with, it's mindful working of what we, and always to be mindful of what we are and how we affect our patients. And then one day we'll look back at this time and realize how much it has changed. And uh, despite this, we, I, look with it, I look forward with a lot of positive um, thoughts that one day that happiness will really be much more simpler than before. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Grace Bunsen Herbosa. That was a very comprehensive lecture po, and we really appreciate that uh, you took the time out to make your slides and uh, make it comprehensive and also provide some sort of nuances po on the anesthesiology part and specifically shared experiences at the Philippine General Hospital, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, before we move on to the Q&A session, 
uh, <clears throat> I strongly encourage po all our attendees who are now numbering uh, in Zoom po, no? 508 attendees po, but there are so much uh, more uh, participants po in our YouTube channel. And as of this moment, we have uh, 965 registrants for your webinar po, uh, Dr. Grace. So that, that's, that just goes to show the importance of the topic. So your, ano po, your excellent presentation, ma'am. Uh, the poll that is showing here right now shows po uh, how well your presentation was in terms of uh, the general knowledge uh, that was demonstrated, the level of preparedness, po, like I mentioned, in organization, Uh, no, there were no uh, problems in terms of the audio and the video, uh, the use of appropriate language, and finally, po, the, the use of appropriate webinar techniques. So, congratulations, ma'am, and thank you so much. I I will uh, give the floor to Dr. Susie uh, as we start the ball rolling in the Q&A portion. Dr. Susie? Thank you very much, uh, Ray Raymond, and thank you, Grace. Um, Nakapagod ba? <laughs> that was a brilliant... No, academic. No, no, no. Brilliant presentation and I think you do it so effortlessly I mean I'm thinking hindi ba very stressful yung ginagawa ni Grace pero pag nakita nyo siya naririnig nyo parang nakikita nyo kailangan talagang kalmado na no? mindful and um, we really appreciate the time that you spent putting that beautiful presentation together and the fact that we have more than 500 people in the webinar just shows us that Uh, what what you worked on is really going to make a big difference. So thank you so much, Grace. Really brilliant presentation. Okay, so you actually, and if you look in the chat box, you'll see all the congratulations. Yeah, thank uh, you. There, so you will see it, no? Okay, so um, there are a couple of questions, and we don't want to take too many because we also don't want to hold you too long. We know that you have other things to do. Um, so... There's a couple of questions here. Let me just read. Nako, biglang dinamihan nyo naman yung question. Kanina ko, konti lang eh. Sige, we will read. Okay. Um, somebody wanted you to say something more about... Uh, okay. We get blamed for post-induction cardiopulmonary arrest. Our protocol should allow us to give rescue mask ventilation while minimizing tidal volume to prevent aerosolization. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, um, as I mentioned with our experience no, in PGH, first of all, when you get a referral, um, you tell the, uh, when you do, because that's protocols or intubation, you should first of all engage all the ICU units where this is going to be done. They should be aware of the information that they, sh they should give you upon the calling you and what they can do to help you as when you arrive. So the most important information really is it's maybe patient uh, habitus, the vital signs, if the patient's agonal. And the saturation for me is very important. Ang threshold kasi sana mga 90, 92 na saturation, tawagin na kayo, para it's not an emergent intubation. It becomes an elective intubation, so we're all prepared. But what happens in real life is you, they call you at 70%, even 50%. Wow. Okay, so what happens? So when you get there, you see that, that saturation is so low, um, they should have done a pre-oxygenation, meaning it depends on your institution how you define it. We do If it's a nasal ca cannula or high flow, obviously there's some aerosolization with high flow. But we accept it as that, as long as you have your PPEs, you don your PPEs well. You, uh, mask ventilation is allowed with a tight seal, but make sure your filter is there. Your HEPA filter and your HME filters are attached to the mask immediately. So there's not much, I mean, the exhaled air is relatively clean. And then, if you think about it, no, if your patient is agonal, your patient relies on the negative pressure of the intrathoracic cavity to be able to breathe because there's air hunger. Now, the minute in our protocol for a rapid sequence, you give a sedative and a muscle relaxant and do positive pressure ventilation. The minute they lose this negativity by giving just sedation and your muscle relaxants, 
imagine the hemodynamics will crash. They will, they will, they will um, arrest. Kasi wala na negative pressure. So now that's why we, we suggest um, optimization or giving a, a push dose of phenylephrine or even epinephrine, which is very cheap, but only 10 micrograms because you might, you might have a malignant arrhythmia with a high dose epinephrine. So hopefully, uh, with this new protocol, we'll, we'll be able to save more patients. Yeah, and I think um, for those of you who want to go back on the presentation, because Grace talked about this earlier, you can watch it again on YouTube because she addressed this issue earlier. You can go back and watch it. Okay, so uh, just to let you know that we also make the PowerPoints available to you, but you can watch it again on YouTube. I'm going to ask Ish Pargas to join us. Ish, are you still there? Ish, can you join us? Here. Oh, Ish. And, oh, yes. Ish, would you but like to also, uh, wait, I think <laughs> okay, the field health is here. Oh, so yeah. You know, we recommend phenylephrine, but it's not in the formulary. Nah, okay, good. So please, we, yeah. we wrote a appeal well, the director will help us purchasing neosinephrine because it's the shortest, it's short acting, it rapidly, you know, it's really a necessary drug. So if you get the letter from us, from PhilHealth, na sana ma ma include siya sa medications that can be covered by PhilHealth. I think it's going to, to help the community and there's one more, the dexmedetomidine is also not in the formulary, but it's the best said for mechanically ventilated patients. Yeah. Okay, there's hardly any delirium with our patients with dexmedetomidine. Oh, yeah, Ish, you're hearing it from the front line, huh? Yes, ma'am. Let's solve this problem. I mean, it's good. This is a good, <laughs> this is a good time to, you're hearing it from somebody who's a leader in anesthesiology that they need this urgently. So, Ish, and yeah, yeah. And, and so oh. many witnesses, ah, huh? Ish. Oh, and dami. Oh, <laughs> yes, ka na dyan. Oh, yes, ka na. Ah, uh, doctor, uh, sana po may ipadala nyo kahit sa akin today. May email nyo na sa akin yung letter para at least I have. Okay, it. I'll get your email. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes I'll see you. I'll see what good. we can do on that. Po. <laughs> so happy. Okay. Very good. Excellent. Okay, Ish, we have a question for Dr. Grace. Ah, na naman naman so far. I mean, I'm good with the presentation po. Oh, pero you could see all of their ano ha? Yes. All yes. of their uh, challenges and what they're doing. And um, yeah, so, you know, just recognizing these two drugs yes. will help them immensely. Yes, so po. Please, agree. Okay. okay, great. Um, Raymond, I think you've got one or two more questions we can take. Um, go ahead, Raymond. So, so, so I think uh, it, it will be important po, no, since uh, a lot of our attendees upvoted for this question. The question po, Dr. Grace states, is it mandatory that the anesthesiologist be the first one on call for intubation in the ICU, especially in institutions where only a handful of anesthesiologists are available? For example, 12 anesthesiologists for a 200-bed capacity hospital. You know, that's an institutional decision, I think. You have to sit down and talk about your resources, your human resources, and identify the place. Because kami, although we have 60 residents, not all residents are supposed to intubate, only the most senior. That's why we have a dedicated airway team, but we can do that in PGH. No? So I think you should decide. I cannot answer that. It's your, it has to be a decision between your institution and your department, and then, but you should have in mind of course, is success. I mean, the patients, you have to think of that rather than your own, your own, um, whatever, your schedules, I guess. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Grace. And I think uh, we have uh, one more question po from one of our uh, most frequent attendees, po, Emmanuel Garcia. He congratulates you on the comprehensive and well-delivered presentation. And his question po is regarding to, um, are there any special precautions to be taken when performing neuroaxial blocks, 
such as in terms of the PPE or the techniques, are there any precautions po that are uh, particular for those? Uh, first, I guess you're asking about the COVID patient, like our COVID laboring patients, let's say. It's just level four PPE. That's what we use. So same precautions. And besides, it's safer to, to do because we're not facing the patient's airway in any way. So wala namang precaution that's different. It's the same, um, I guess, asepsis and antisepsis guidelines that we do for regular spinal anesthesia. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Grace. Um, are there any questions on your side, Dr. Susie, before we move on to our uh, getting the correct answers to, for, from Dr. Grace on our webinar? Yeah, no, no more questions on, on my end. Uh, I think we can go now to the poll questions, Raymond. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Susie. Um, I'm just uh, looking at the... Can you... Yeah, there, there we go. So just to get the correct answers, Paul, no, from uh, Dr. Herbosa, uh, we revisit our webinar questions that were given also by our resource speaker. For the first question, it states, a 76-year-old male weighing 70 kilograms uh, at a kipnik with labored breathing was referred to the Department of Anesthesiology for emergent intubation for pneumonia as he was being wheeled in at the uh, intensive care unit uh, his vital signs were blood pressure of 95 over 55, uh, respiratory rate of 28, heart rate of 106, and SpO2 of 73%. As you approach him, uh, what do you do? What was the answer, po, Dr. Agris? Um, this is 72% answered uh, that answered correctly. That's pre-oxygenate with a tight seal mask and filters in place and administer your induction agent. So this is fine. Uh, the first answer is wrong because you have to sedate your patient and not just address the relaxation. And besides, as I said, if you don't pre-oxygenate, you, you, it's an impending arrest. Okay. Okay. And then for the second question, ma'am, it states, Paul, after securing the patient's airway, you attach him to a mechanical ventilator with initial settings at uh, RR14, tidal volume 360 milliliters, PEEP at 10, and F FIO to 100%. Yeah. Arterial blood gas shows a pH of 7.2. Uh, what do you do? Oh, the answer is the first one. Because our target PAO2, this is the PAO2, so it's an arterial oxygenation. It's 60 to 80 is correct. Uh, remember, I said plateau pressure should be less than 30. Driving pressure should be less than 15, so that the moves number four, uh, three and four. And then we never target a PO2 that high between 130 to 200 for this agonal patients. So just remember, I know a lot of us are not trained to do critical care uh, medicine, but I guess setting up a ventilator initially, we can do that. And I just gave you the very basic concepts on mechanical ventilation settings. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Uh, yes. Siguro pumasa kayo, no? May mga pumasa dyan. Happy sila. <laughs> okay. Um, before we, we, we end, we're going to ask Ish Pargas to say a few words on behalf of um, PhilHealth and then Grace, of course, to give her parting words. So, Ish, over to you. Please unmute yourself, uh, Dr. Ish. Thank you, Pop. Okay, again, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you very much to the organizers, to the UP community, to the very gracious hosts natin, Dr. Pineda, of course, Ma'am Susie, and of course, Raymond, Dr. Raymond, and to our um, very esteemed uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Herbosa, and uh, to everyone who have attended. I, I hope uh, PhilHealth, in partnership with the UP community and the uh, National Telehealth Center, uh, would be able to provide more platforms like this in order for us to learn from our experts. So uh, with regard to the uh, request earlier, I do hope to receive the uh, official document so that I would know what drugs actually are being requested in order so uh, for us we'll have to act on it accordingly. So, uh, and everyone, of course, would be uh, informed on what will happen on that. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you. Dr. Thank Agri, you. thank you.
Thank you, Ish. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ish, for joining oh us. Gosh. It's it's in your inbox. Now. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Open, open your inbox, Grace. Got oh, it. Okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, Grace, parting words. You have so many people listening to you right now. Um, and so many what, people. Yeah. In Q to the, box yeah, yeah. Yeah. To the yeah. anesthesia community, uh, believe me, I'm so proud of what we're doing. And uh, what's really essential is really building your team. And when I say team, it's not, it's a team within anesthesia. And it's, it's a team also within your institution. It's a team you trust and it's open to surprises. And whatever happens, um, this, in whatever you do, please try to document everything because we have to track everything and learn from it. You cannot just say, ah, nangyari to eh, ilang beses kaya. Track it. it. We're now virtual. We're now using the internet and all this Google Docs. So it's so easy to track everything. So you can see exactly if you're making progress and you know these little victories really spark joy in us so i wish you all well you keep safe protect yourself and um, continue learning so i hope you learned a lot this afternoon thank you thank you for the invitation Thank, thank you, you so much, uh, Dr. Robert Bosa, and thank you also to Senior Vice President Ish Pargas from the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. Uh, we really learned a lot as evidence po by the numerous congratulatory messages uh, that we have been receiving po uh, over at the chat box. I just wanted to share with the group po the demographics po in terms of the distribution of our attendees. We have attendees po who have registered and attended all the way from Lawag City General Hospital in Agudin, Ilocos Sur, Region 1, from Batangas Provincial Hospital in Lemery, Batangas in Calabarzon, Region 4A po, uh, from the Governor Celestino Gallares Memorial Hospital, Tagbilaran City, Bohol in Central Visayas in Region 7, Northern Mindanao Medical Center, Cagayan de Oro, Northern Mindanao in Region 10, and the Maguindanao Provincial Hospital in Sharif Agwak, Maguindanao in Barm. And also, you are also international po, uh, Dr. Grace. Uh, this means that uh, there we have uh, attendees from outside of the Philippines, uh, particularly from the Central Mamuju District Hospital in Jakarta, Indonesia. Okay. From the General Hospital in Denpasar in Indonesia again. And from the Surrey Memorial Hospital in Surrey, Canada po. So congratulations again uh, for that excellent presentation, ma'am. Uh, over to uh, Dr. Susie for uh, for our closing uh, part and parting remarks po. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Raymond. And um, Grace, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I think um, that was a very uh, inspirational parting words also. You talked about leadership and truly your leadership has been very evident over these past a uh, few months that we've been struggling with COVID and we still continue to seek inspiration from the work that you're doing and that all anesthesiologists are doing. As you said, quietly, they're not seen, but you are really in the way of harm. So on behalf of, I think, all of the people who are watching, thank you. Thank you so much. Saludo, saludo kami. Okay, so next week, very exciting topic. We were able to get Dr. Cynthia Saloma who is in charge of the uh, research on gene sequencing from the University of the Philippines. And in this day where we're talking about mutations and you're hearing about D614G, what does the mutation mean? What does all of this, what are the, what, what is, what are the changes that are going to happen because of changes that we're seeing in, in the... Uh, the, the gene sequencing and the genes of this virus, we're going to have that as a topic next week. So research on gene sequencing and mutation and the implications for COVID-19 management. Don't miss it. We're also going to have Ega, Eva Kutionko, who we had on, I think, the third or the fourth webinar, but now she's going to give us a short, uh, a short message on the vision for genomic medicine. And um, I think as we, as we go through this webinar series, uh, we are all learners. We are all um, a community of individuals who want to do better 
And next week, we're going to have a cutting edge uh, presentation on what's happening on genetic research in this country. So make it a habit to be with us every Friday. So over to you, Raymond. Thank you so much, Dr. Susie. Indeed, it's very cutting edge work and research. And we are really very excited in learning more about genomic medicine, in particular during this time when there have been discussions po, uh, kanina po, balabanggit po ni Dr. Herbosa with regards to the airborne uh, aspect po of uh, COVID-19. But also, uh, for next week, we will be talking about something that's uh, one of the top uh, topics po and hot topics right now is the mutation of a SARS-CoV-2. So makita-kita po tayo. Please make it a habit every Friday from 12 noon to 2 p.m. to join us for the University of the Philippines and Philippine Health Insurance Corporation's uh, Stop COVID Deaths webinar series. So uh, we are winding down with our uh, first season, kumbaga po. And we look forward to having more and more uh, attendees and participants, po, uh, particularly as we move on to our grand rounds that we have mentioned uh, earlier on. So, uh, maraming salamat po at makita-kita po tayo ulit sa susunod na linggo. This has been uh, Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento from the University of the Philippines National Telehealth Center. Keep safe, keep healthy, and see you online. <laughs>